Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about generation of genetically modified organisms and in the last couple of modules what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the physiology of host as well as we have discussed about different types of vector or the transforming agents what you can use. Uh, to develop the genetically modified organisms in a particular host. In this context, we were, uh, we were discussing about how to uh, produce the protein in different host strains and in this discussion, we were discuss uh, so far we have discussed about the E. coli as an expression system and in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the remaining uh, expression system such as yeast assay expression system, insect cell line as an expression system and lastly we are going to discuss about the mammalian cells as an expression system. So when you talk about the E. coli as an expression system, we have discussed many aspects. We have discussed about how to clone the protein into the E. coli expression system, what are the different types of host and the strategies which are available for you to uh, produce the protein under the uh, different uh, different host systems and in following this context now today we are going to start the lecture with the discussion about how to control the protein production in the E. coli expression system. So there are many factors which are affecting the protein synthesis within the E. coli. One of the major factor which we have discussed in the previous lecture as well is the strength of the promoter itself. So the if you, you can have the uh, two types of promoter either the promoter which is very very strong promoter and the strong promoter is going to facilitate the easy binding of the RNA polymerase and that is how it is going to facilitate the more turnover number of uh, the transcription events and as a result you are going to have the high level of uh, RNA in the RNA pool and uh, subsequently as a result you are going to generate the more amount of protein. In addition to that if you have the uh, uh, if, you, you, if you have the weak promoter, the weak promoter is going to go, go, is not going to support the protein production and as a result you are going to have the low, low, uh, low level of protein expressions. Both the strong promoter as well as the weak promoter has its own advantage as well as the disadvantages. The strong promoter gives a very high amount of protein that is why it is good for the protein production if the protein is uh, small in size and if it is easily getting uh, uh, folded. But if, if it is a big protein and it requires the time for getting folded, then you need to use the weak promoter which actually going to give the cellular machinery to fold the protein properly. Uh, apart from the promoter as a deciding factor to control the protein production or the efficiency of protein production, you also have to consider about the another uh, parameter which is called as the shine dergano sequences. So shine dergano sequences actually allows the binding of ribosome machinery to the uh, to the uh, to the recombinant DNA, and it actually controls the overall protein production from the particular uh, uh, clone. So the distance between the shine dergano sequences and the start codon is very very important for the efficient transcription as well as efficient translation of that recombinant DNA. Along with that the secondary structures which are being present in the promoter are also going to affect the efficiency of the protein or efficiency of the gene expression. Apart from that 
the growth conditions or the growth media which you are going to use has a very very dramatic as well as significant impact on do the particular protein productions. For example, you can imagine a protein which you are using and that requires a large quantity of arginine or lysine or glutamine. In, in those cases, you have to ensure that the media components should have these amino acids or these essential amino acids. So, the growth media, we have already discussed about the growth media which are actually uh, going to be used for uh, uh, growing the bacterial cells and the growth media has a dramatic effect on the gene expression. Either the media components provide the raw material, this is like what, what, what we have discussed so far, whether you, you are, if suppose your protein requires lysine, arginine and glutamate, then these amino acids should be present or their precursors should be present in the media or to provide the amino acid for the synthesis of a particular protein. In addition, some of the growth media are very, very rich in carbon source and that actually going to generate a large number of cell mass and once you have the large number of cell mass, subsequently or eventually you are going to have the large number of, uh, you are going to have the uh, more production of the particular protein from the cell. Uh, cell. So, apart from this, the third factor is the codon usage. You know that the genetic, codon, genetic codes which are 64 in number where you have the 61 codes, which, 61 codes which are available for the 21 different amino acids whereas the three codes which are UA, UGA and UAG are the stop codons. Uh, so, as a result, every organism, so these 61 amino, 61 codons are every organism is using, but the every organism has a particular type of preference for a set of genetic codes uh, to express a few of, uh, to express few of the amino acids or uh, a class of amino acids. In those cases, what will happen is that if you are cloning a protein into the E. coli expression system, you have to ensure that the tRNA corresponding to these, uh, genet uh, these uh, codons should be available and this particular type of unique problem is called as the codon usage or the, uh, so expressing these sequences requires tRNA to recognize the genetic code. But if the host expression system does not have the tRNA or low level of a particular tRNA, then it will either delay the synthesis or it will stop the synthesis at a particular amino acid. You can imagine a situation that uh, E. coli does not have the tRNA for phenylalanine which the gene which you have cloned into that particular clone, particular E. coli is uh, required then in those cases as soon as the RNA polymerase or the particular uh, cellular uh, biosynthesis machinery will reach to that particular phenylalanine, it will not going to get the tRNA and as a result the protein synthesis will stop or it will going to generate the protein which is of the truncated in nature. So, uh, and this uh, problem can be circumvent if you over express these uh, additional tRNAs into the host strain either you make the chimeric uh, 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 expression system where the you can clone these uh, tRNAs into the chromosome or you can supply these chromosome gene uh, supply these uh, tRNA genes cloned onto the separate plasmids and you can transform your plasmid as well as these additional tRNA plasmids. So, if you do so, you could be able to overcome the codon usage problem. So, if that happens, uh, it will actually going to produce less protein or truncated protein. So, if you, if you encounter the codon uh, 
codon usage problem, you have to either over express these additional tRNAs into the separate plasmid or you have to generate the uh, chimeric uh, uh, host which will actually going to have these additional tRNA genes in uh, cloned into their chromosome. So, either of these strategies will overcome the codon usage problem and it will allow you to, gen to, uh, to over express the protein. So, before you decide to over express a particular gene, you have to, you have to verify as well as the you have to test that this problem is does not exist, which means you have to critically evaluate the gene uh, structure or the gene sequence to, to know that the particular type of tRNA would not be a problem. Okay? So, now let us move on. So, the protein which you over express in E. coli could be, could be over express uh, as such or the native protein or you can have the protein which is over express in the form of a fusion protein or the protein which actually going to have the additional tags. So, the protein in E. coli expression system can be uh, expressed as a hybrid protein which is also called as the fusion protein where the reading frame of the two gene, one, one gene which is for your foreign gene as well as the one of the gene which will be for the fusion tag is going to be uh, in frame. So, as a result when the protein, when the cellular machinery is going to over express your the, the foreign gene, it is also going to over express the fusion tag and as a result what you are going to have is you are going to have the chimeric fusion protein which means the protein is going to have the additional tag or additional uh, protein from the other portion and this fusion tag could be placed either on the end terminus which means it could be placed on this side or it could be placed on the C terminus side. There are many different types of tags which are available for these particular uh, applications. You can have the beta galactosidase as, a, as an enzyme as a tag and the vector what you can use for this purpose is called PUC, P blue script or PGM. Uh, what is the advantage of this particular type of uh, tag? You can use this tag for blue white screening as well as you can use the affinity purification. Similar, you can have the maltose binding protein or the MBP, the vector what you can use where the PMAL is already been cloned is called as the PMAL and it has an advantage that you can use the PMAL tag or the maltose binding uh, protein as a tag to purify using the affinity, pro, uh, affinity chromatography. Similarly, you have the thioredoxin or the TRIX as a fusion tag. The, the vector what you can use is called p -trick and it has an advantage that you can use the thioredoxin tag as uh, in the affinity chromatography. Similarly, you have the polyhistidine tag and the, the couple of uh, PET series vectors can be used for and you have the advantage that it would be used in the affinity chromatography. Then you have the GST tag, the glutathione S transferase tag and the, in the vector what you can use is the many series of PGX vector and that has an advantage that you can use that in affinity chromatography or you can use this in the reporter gene assay. Similarly, you have the alkaline phosphatase as a tag and the vector what you can use to generate the fusion protein is called PTA1529 and that has an advantage to use the alkaline phosphatase in the reporter gene assay. So, what is the, uh, what is the advantage of producing the E. coli in the fusion tag? You have the multiple advantages if you are expressing the fusion protein in, a, in, in the form of a fusion tag. One of the easier, one of the uh, uh, prominent advantage is that it actually allows you to do a easy purification which means you uh, see if you go by the conventional chromatography techniques, you might have to use the different types of chromatography columns like anion exchange column, cation exchange column or the gel filtration column to get the purified protein and the disadvantage of running the multiple chromatography column is that at every step you are going to lose some amount of protein and 
at the end your overall production of that particular purified protein is going to be lower. Compared to this in, in, the, uh, in, the, F, in the fusion proteins you are going to use the affinity columns and these affinity columns are having very very exclusive affinity for that particular fusion tag. So, as a result all other protein uh, when you pass through the lysate to the column all other proteins are not going to bind to the column whereas, the your protein will bind because it has a fusion tag and then subsequently you will wash the column and elude the protein. So, in that process what will happen is first thing is you are going to get the purification which is very very high. Number two you are going to use only single column which is that affinity column and that actually will give you very high purification compared to utilizing the uh, multiple conventional chromatography techniques. Number three it is going to be fast because you are just simply running the single column. So, it is it is going to save the time for you. Number four since you are saving the time and the protein is uh, getting purified at a faster rate you are not going to get the protein degradation which means the protein is going to be saved from the proteases and other, uh, other enzyme which are present in the cell lysate. Number 5 since you are doing the single, single, single step purifications it is going to be economically viable as well as it is going to give you the higher production because you are not going to lose the protein in uh, as, as you are going to lose when you run the conventional chromatography columns and in every column steps you are going to lose some protein. And the lastly since you are going to purify in single step you does not require a large quantity of human resource to perform the uh, protein purification which means if you are going to talk about uh, performing the purification in, uh, a, in a in a in a industrial setup you need the lesser main power to purify the protein compared to if you go with the conventional chromatography techniques now since you have the tags you can actually plan the experiment in such a way that you can actually target your over expression of your protein to a, a specific cellular compartment. A fusion protein can be targeted to the different cellular organelles for various regions. So, this is more more an advantage for the, the for the academic purposes for example, if you want to over express your protein to the mitochondria or endoplasmic reticulum or plasma membrane or to some uh, specific sites you can actually put that particular kind of fusion tag and as a result what will happen is the once that fusion tag is present the, pro the re machinery will recognize and that is how the protein will go to that particular. Uh, particular site within the cell. Uh, in addition to that in some of the for example, in the bacterial system you can actually put the periplasmic localization sequences and in that case what will happen is once this fusion, fusion protein is going to be over expressed the protein will go to the periplasmic fractions and what is the advantage of sending the protein to the periplasmic fraction is that the periplasmic fractions are away from the cytosolic site. So, if isolation of these protein are going to be easier compared to the cytosolic protein. Number two, the, uh, the, the you are not going to face lot of contamination because the amount of protein which are present in the periplasmic fractions is much less compared to the amount of protein which are present in the cytosol. So, as a result if you suppose put the periplasmic targeting sequences the protein will accumulate into the periplasm and hence can help for the easy isolation. Number three some of the proteins are having a very very short half life and as you know that the half life of a protein is always been decided by the number of the uh, uh, number of amino acids which are present on the end terminus of the protein. So, some of the proteins are uh, end terminus region is very very prone for proteolytic cleavage in some cases the proteins have its own intrinsic uh, uh, protease activity and as a result it actually cleaves its own protein as soon as it is synthesized and some of some of the uh, some sometime what happen is these kind of thing are problematic because it does not allow you to over express the protein in a 
full length. In those cases what you do is you produce a fusion protein and in that fusion protein what will happen is either depending on what is the uh, scenario of that particular protein either you put the fusion tag into the N terminus site or you put the fusion tag on the C terminus site and either of these sites will be get blocked. So, in some cases what happen is if you put the fusion tag onto the N terminus site it actually enhances the overall uh, half life of your chimeric protein and as a result you are going to have the better survivability of this particular protein or better stability of this particular protein within the cytosol. Uh, so, in many cases a fusion tag hides the potential protease site on the foreign protein and enhances its half life. Number 4, the fusion proteins are so, the, the tag what you are going to put are much more soluble compared to the tag which the compared to the, uh, the protein what you are going to over express because most of these tags are already been optimized that they are been uh, expressing into the E. coli system and they are expressing as a soluble factor. Uh, so, once you put a fusion tag and uh, once you generate a, a chimeric protein containing the fusion tag, the, uh, the fusion tag uh, component or the counterpart is actually brings the solubility into the overall system and as a result the chimeric protein is uh, more soluble compared to your own protein. For example, if you put the GST as a fusion tag onto the N terminus, GST is a cytosolic protein, it is very very soluble into the uh, E. coli system. So, once you generate a chimeric protein along with this, the, since the GST is very soluble, it actually uh, gives that solubility parameter to your protein also and as a result the whole chimeric protein is more, more uh, becomes more soluble. So, keeping the tag at the N terminus direct the protein synthesis and hence help in increasing the solubility of the foreign protein. Now, the question is once you have the fusion protein and in some of the applications the fusion proteins are not required. For example, if you are going to use this protein for generating the ELISA or suppose you want to use this protein for, uh, uh, for uh, solving the structure using the x-ray, in those cases the fusion tag is going to interfere in downstream applications. For example, if you would like to use this protein which is x in, in, in uh, for a therapeutic uh, uh, purposes, for example, if you are going to use this x as an insulin, for example, if you are uh, generating a fusion tag of insulin along with the GST, you do not want a patient to receive the GST as well as the fusion tag. In those cases, you have to remove the fusion tag or remove or, or cut this particular uh, chimeric protein with the help of some proteases so that the fusion tag is going to be separate. How to do that? So, for removal of fusion tag, for many biotechnology applications a protein is expressed as a fusion protein either to the N terminus or the C terminus for the easy purification. But after the purifications the tag need to be removed for downstream applications such as if we are trying to use this uh, protein for vaccine for uh, developing the ELISA or develop for we, uh, suppose we would like to use this protein for structure solutions or suppose we would like to use this protein simply for driving a catalytic reactions within the patient or into the uh, bioreactors or sometime if suppose you want to use this protein for therapeutic uh, protein. So, it you want this protein to go and inside the cell, inside the uh, human body or inside the host and drive some reactions and in those cases the fusion tag are going to interfere or in some cases the fusion tags are definitely going to cause the allergic reactions. In those cases the fusion tag has to be removed. Uh, so, for removing the fusion tag, uh, uh, we have the couple of uh, fuse, uh, remove, couple of reagents. For example, you can use the cyanogen bromide. Cyanogen bromide is going to cleave the tag just after the methionine. Simply, you have the hydroxylamine. Hydroxylamine is going to 
cleave the uh, ta fusion tags between the asparagine and proline. Then you have the enterokinase and you have a enterokinase uh, cleavage site. So, enterokinase cleavage site would be present between the uh, fusion tags and once you treat this fusion tag with the enterokinase, it is going to cleave here and uh, as a result the GST is going to be removed and your protein X is free for the uh, for downstream applications. Then you have the factor 10A, the factor 10A cleavage site is also present and the factor 10A is always cleaving after the arginine. Similarly, you have the alpha thrombine and alpha thrombine is cleaving the chimeric protein between the arginine and glycine. Then you have the trypsin and trypsin is cleaving the protein just after the arginine or the lysine. And then lastly you have the subtilin, subtilin is cleaving after the arginine. So, these are not the final list or the exhaustive list of the cleavage reagents which are available for the uh, for, for separating the fusion tag from the uh, foreign gene or foreign protein. Now the question is how to remove the tag from the your protein. So, for that you can use the same affinity column what you have been using for purifying the protein. So, you can imagine that uh, you have you, you have cloned a protein into a his tag for example, you can use the pet series vector and you have overexpressed the protein. Now, this is your chimeric protein which you have overexpressed which contains the histidine tags and now what you do is you take the thrombin, alpha thrombin and treat it. So, what will, ha what will happen is the alpha thrombin is going to cleave the, uh, cleave the linker region between the histidine tag as well as the protein and as a result you are going to have the tag separately and as well as the protein separately. Now, what you do is take this complete uh, complex mixture and load it onto the affinity column like nickel NTA column. So, as a result what will happen is the nickel NTA is going to bind the histidine tag because it has a very high affinity for histidine tag, but it does not have any affinity for your protein. So, as a result what will happen is the, the histidine tag is going to bind to the beads of the column whereas the your protein will be present in the uh, into the flow through and you can collect the protein from the column and you can use this protein for the downstream applications. So, how to do the removal of fusion tag? The fusion tag is uh, in, in most of the fusion tag you are going to have the protease cutting site or the site is sensitive for the chemical treatment. So, if you treat the fusion protein with a protease or chemical agent that will cut the fusion protein to release the target protein that is what is been done. Now, if you pass this cleavage mixture and allow the binding of the tag to the affinity column uh, which is actually in this case we have used the nickel NTA column. The column will bind your tag and it will not allow uh, the, this tag to go into the flow through whereas your protein has lost the affinity for the column because it does not have the tag now anymore and the column the protein will come into the flow through. So, this is all about the overexpressing and production of protein into the E. coli expression system. We have discussed many aspects which are very common for the different uh, for the other expression uh, expression system as well. Now, we will move on to the next expression system. So, in the list we have the next expression system which is the yeast as an expression system. So, yeast is the simplest eukaryotic organisms and unicellular eukaryotic organism which you can use for over expressing those proteins which will not going to over express uh, nicely into the prokaryotic system. So, yeast is the simplest unicellular eukaryotic cell available for protein production. It is easy to manipulate and the production cost is very low in comparison to the other prokaryotic system. So, in the in the in the eukaryotic system you have the yeast, you have the insect cell lines, you have the mammalian cells, you have the virus or bacteriophage based 
protein production system. Apart from so, uh, uh, so in comparison to these systems, yeast is the simplest system in terms of performing the transformations, in terms of the screening the clones, as well as in terms of producing the protein. And the uh, ultimately, the cost of the protein production in the yeast system is very very low compared to the other eukaryotic expression systems. It offers most of the advantages available in a typical eukaryotic cell. In addition, a large amount of genetic molecular and cellular aspects of yeast is known and this knowledge has helped us to design better protein production strategies and troubleshooting. So, you know that yeast is very widely studied organisms. So, because of that the yeast is uh, being genetically manipulated, we have very in depth knowledge about the biochemistry of these cells as well as we know each and every minute details of the molecular biology protocols or molecular biology strategies which you can use to, uh, to manipulate the um, yeast as an expression system. And as a result of this, uh, the people are using the yeast very extensively for, gen for producing the protein which requires the eukaryotic machinery. Now, in the yeast you have the two choices of host, one is called non-methylotrophic host and the other one is called as the methylotrophic host. Non-methylotrophic host means these, uh, these uh, yeast molecules or yeast organisms does not depends on or does not uh, accept the methanol as a one carbon source or carbon source and uh, instead of methanol they use the other carbon sources. So, these species do not have the ability to utilize one carbon compound such as methanol and that is why these are called as non-methylotrophic uh, uh, yeast strains. But it can be able to utilize other carbon sources such as glucose, lactose, malose and starch and alkane. The examples in this category are uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, kale lactase and uh, wild lipolytica. These yeast strains are mostly being used for fermentation to produce the alcohol. The major advantage of this class is better understanding of molecular biology, biochemistry and fermentation technological aspects of these strains. So, the non-methylotrophic host strains or non-methylotrophic yeast strains are not using the methanol as a one carbon source. Instead of that, it is using the other carbon sources such as glucose, lactose and all other kinds of sugars as well as the alkane. And mostly these strains are being used for fermentation process. These strains are being used for uh, producing the alcohol and other al uh, um, fermentation related products. And these, pro these uh, strains are less popular in terms of utilization, in terms of their utilization for the uh, protein productions. Uh, so, these strains are not being utilized in terms of production of heterologous proteins. Now, methylotrophic yeast. Methylotrophic yeast as the name suggests, these yeast, yeast strains are using the methanol as a one carbon source. So, these strains have the advantage that they have the ability to utilize one carbon compound such as methanol as carbon and energy source. In addition, these strains have high level of methanol oxidizing enzyme and that allow them to be very strong and grow in a high density. The example of yeast in this class are Pichia pectoris, Pichia angusta and Pichia methonilca and C. boydini. So, these are the strains, the methylotropic strains which people very often use for protein productions, uh, for protein productions. Now, if you want to use the yeast as an expression system, the first step is that you are going to put the you are going to transform the recombinant DNA what you have generated into the yeast vectors. So, we have discussed a couple of yeast vectors in the past and we have 
uh, we have also discussed about the transformation methods where uh, you 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 are going to use the, either the spheroplast based transformation methods or the lithium acetate based transformation methods so in for protein production mostly people use the lithium acetate or the electroporation as a popular method for transformation of yeast uh, the transformations are then uh, selected it's based on the uh, the kind of vector what you are going to use so in the second step you are going to select the vectors as well as uh, the transformed uh, uh, host strains uh, either you will uh, so mostly people use the axotropic markers such as uh, ura3 leucine2 or tryptophan1 or histidine4 or sometimes you use the antibody resistant genes such as the g418 hygromycin etc once these two steps are over then you have to use the uh, promoters so just like as we discussed in the uh, in the e coli expression system there are different types of promoter also present in the yeast as an expression system so you have the two different types of promoter present in the yeast expression system either you have the constitutive promoters or the inducible promoters so in the constitutive promoters these constitutive promoters are the promoter which are present in the housekeeping genes so these promoters actually belongs to the housekeeping gene and as a result the expression is non inducible which means they are going to give you the protein but that protein production would be in proportion to the number of cells what you are going to have you are not going to be able to use any inducible agent for example if you remember in the case of e coli we were using the iptg or lactose or some kind of inducible system where we were using the that kind of environmental changes like for example when we were using the ci3 promoters we were you are we were changing the temperature and as a result uh, changing the temperature it is actually also driving the protein production but in these cases you cannot do that because most of the constitutive promoters are the promoter which are belonging to the housekeeping genes and you know the purpose of housekeeping gene is to produce the protein at a consistent rate and throughout the uh, uh, life of the particular organisms one of the classical example is the ldh so ldh protein is a Uh, housekeeping gene or actin or myosin most of the structural proteins which we which we are present or which are actually be a part of the uh, formation of the plasma membrane uh, are actually belonging to the housekeeping genes so housekeeping genes are never been inducible because uh, they are been consistently uh, producing the protein the protein production starts with the growth of the yeast and as a result it is proportional to the cell mass example of these promoters are gap dph gm1 etc now the second class is the inducible promoters inducible promoters are the promoter where you can actually use some class of inducers to produce the protein in a large quantities examples are pickia pectoris expresses two alcohol oxidases like ox1 and ox2 whereas the pickia augusta expresses methanol oxidase mox and all these three genes if you take the promoter out of these three genes these promoters are going to be inducible promoter because as soon as you add the alcohol these genes are been uh, the promoter which is uh, uh, present in front of these genes are going to generate the large quantity of these uh, proteins the promoter of ox1 and mox are present on yeast vector and it has been used to drive the expression of a foreign protein in the inducible matter the protein production is controlled by a balance of repression and induction presence of other carbon sources such as glucose represses the transcription of ox1 gene but in the presence of trace amount of methanol it induces the ox1 promoter mediated protein production so inducible promoter just like if you remember if you have the very la- small quantities of lactose that actually is going to give the leaky expression in the e coli system similarly here if you have the alternate carbon source for example if you have the glucose the yeast is not going to use 
the methanol as a carbon source instead it will use the carbon uh, glucose as a carbon source in those cases the glucose is going to repress the activity of ox1 promoters but if you use the methanol or tiny amount of methanol and that actually is going to induce the uh, ox1 promoters and as a result you are going to see the protein production if you have cloned the protein in front of the ox1 promoters so this is just a summary of different promoter as well as the expression systems uh, present in the e coli expression system you have non methylic strains such as s cerevisiae k lactis or y lipolytica uh, whereas you have the methylonic strain such as pickia pectoris or pitia methylonica as uh, you have the um, constitutive promoter such as gap dph and all other kind of uh, promoters whereas you have the inducible promoters such as adh1 adh4 and ox1 uh, mox and all these promoter can be used to drive the protein production into the yeast as an expression system you have the choice that you can produce the protein either into the cytosol or you can have the pro, um, choice that you secrete the protein into the external supernatant and that depends whether you have the any kind of tag which is present on the protein so if you have a tag which is present on the protein uh, that protein will going to uh, secrete out so cytoplasmic targeted proteins the expression of the protein targeted to the cytoplasm is very high but the recovery is very difficult each cell is very hard and high pressure homogenization is required homogenizer is required to disrupt the cell wall the recovery is very less and a fraction of total soluble protein comes out so if you over express the protein as a cytosolic protein the protein production is going to be very very high but the disadvantage is that since the e coli uh, the yeast has a very strong cell wall the cell wall is not going to be Uh, broken very easily and as a result even if you use the high pressure homogenizers like french press and all other kind of homogenizers even then the recovery of the protein from the yeast cell is going to be very less now if you are putting a uh, secretory uh, components like protein if you put in tagged with a secretory signal such as s cerevisiae alpha mating factors that actually will promote the uh, the secretion of the protein into the secretory pathway and that actually the signal peptide is processed in e coli vesicular transport system and appeared in culture media so in that case the protein will be secreted out it will present in the culture media uh, but it depends about the protein which is going to be over expressed it is very difficult to decide whether you would like to use the cytoplasmic cytoplasmic pathway or the secretory pathway because both are these pathways have their own advantages as well as the disadvantages and that actually you have to decide depending on the type of protein which you would like to over express in yeast expression systems now we have the multiple steps which you have to follow to uh, to for the protein productions in the yeast expression system the first step is that you do the transformation of the yeast with the recombinant uh, with the uh, recombinant dna so transform uh, once that is the, the once you generated the transform uh, transformed yeast the first step is the transfer the transformed yeast into a 5 ml media with suitable selection markers and incubate that for 2 days at 20 degree 28 degree celsius with shaking at 180 rpm so the first step is that you gen first transform the bacteria uh, first transform the yeast with the uh, foreign dna or recombinant dna then inoculate that into a 5 ml media with selection marker and then incubate that on 28 degree celsius for 180 rpm that actually will allow the yeast to grow at a very high uh, density once it reach to a specific density then you allow the culture to reach the do with the od of uh, 5 to 7 and now resuspend the cells in a new media without carbon source so in this particular type of media you are not going to use the methanol as a carbon source here you are going to use the regular carbon source such as 
glucose or other kind of carbon sources and then you allow the met, uh, uh, yeast to grow to a OD of 5 to 6. Once it reaches to a OD of 5 to 6, then what you do is you pellet down these yeast cells, put it into a new media and in this new media, you are not going to provide the glucose or other one carbon sources as a uh, for the carbon source. Instead, you were going to induce the culture with the methanol, the 1 percent methanol twice daily and as a result what will happen is the, met the met since you know that the methanol is very toxic, but for these particular type of strains because they have the uh, ability to metabolize the methanol, you have to use the uh, very small quantity of methanol, only the 1 percent methanol you have to use that too twice daily. Uh, and that will actually induce the promoters of OX1 or MOX and that actually will allow the production of the protein. Once the protein is being produced for in couple of days because that actually will take time, then you harvest these cells by centrifugation and analyze the expression on the SDS page just like as we discussed in the equali system as well. Now, so far we have discussed about the E. coli as an expression system, we have discussed about the yeast as an expression system and now we will move on to discuss about the insect cell as an expression system. So if you would like to use the insects as, a, as, an, as an expression system, you have to use the, it's, uh, what, we, what you have to do is you have to perform the multiple steps to achieve the protein production in the insect cell lines. So, as a eukaryote, eukaryotic expression system offers protein modifications, processing and transport system. Compared to yeast, the downstream processing and recovery of cytosolic protein is much easier in bacterial expression system. You, if you remember, we have discussed that the yeast has a very, very strong cell wall and because of that, the recovery as well as the processing of these cells are much more difficult which is actually going to be simplified in the baculo expression system or the insect cell line as an expression system because insect cell lines are easy to break and the recovery is much better. So, if you would like to produce the protein, you have to follow these steps. First, you have to clone the foreign gene into the transfer vector, then you have to generate the recombinant baculoviruses or baculovectors. Then you have to screen the uh, recombinant baculovirus, then you have to culture the recombinant insect cell lines and ultimately you have to do the protein production. So, let us start with the first step and the first step is the cloning of foreign gene in transfer vector. You have, we have already discussed about the design of the vectors which are available in the baculo expression system. In the baculo expression system, you have a vector which is actually containing the flanking sequences which are present from the uh, vector viruses. So, you have the N terminus flanking sequences, you have the C terminus flanking sequences. In between, you are going to have the promoter which is uh, for the polyhydrin promoter, uh, a polyhydrin promoter, then you have the in the middle of in front of the promoter you have the cloning site and then next to the cloning site you have the polyhydrin termination site. So, that this polyhydrin pr uh, promoter is going to drive the production of the gene which you are going to clone into the cloning site and the upstream as well as the downstream sequences which means these sequences are required are from the virus genome and that actually helps in homologous recombinations. So, what you have to do is for the cloning of the foreign DNA into the transfer DNA and transfer vector, uh, you clone your particular protein into the cloning site. Now, the next step is the regeneration of recombinant baculovirus. You have the two approaches to generate the recombinant baculoviruses. In approach 1, what you are going to do is, you can imagine that 
you have the insect cell lines. So, first in the first step what you do is you take the insect cell line and first transfect with the plain baculovirus and that actually will going to produce the transform insect cell line. Now, in the second step what you do is you transfect these cells with a transfer vector containing the foreign DNA. Now, what will happen is once these two vectors the, the, the transformed uh, insect cell lines which where you have already put the viruses and these transformed cell when they will be transfected with the transfer DNA containing the foreign gene, when they will replicate for 2 to 3 cycles what will happen is there will be a homologous recombination between these two factors, these two regions which means the upstream as well as the downstream region are going to do the homologous recombination. So, this is the transfer vector which you have transformed in the second step and this is your uh, plain virus. So, as a result what will happen is this whole cassette from this place is going to be replaced with the, your foreign gene and as a result you are going to generate the recombinant DNA or recombinant virus which actually will going to contain your gene or your cassette instead of the uh, virus its intrinsic polyhedrin gene and as a result now what you do is you take this virus and you can use that for uh, uh, protein production. In the approach to what you have to do is in approach to the baculovirus genome is engineered to introduce two unique restriction site BSU uh, 360, uh, 361 uh, onto the gene 603 as well as onto the gene uh, 1629 and both of these genes are present in the uh, within the uh, present in the polyhydrin gene within the viral genome. When modified viral genome is treated with the restriction enzyme, so when uh, if you take this modified baculovirus treated with the BS2361 what will happen is it is going to be cleaved off from here and you as a result you are going to remove the complete cassette of polyhydrin gene. So, you are going to lose this particular fragment. Now, once you uh, if you if you transform this particular fragment the cleaved fragment. It, you are not going to get any viruses because you are actually missing the crucial uh, function of the gene 1629 which is required for the viral replications. Now, this linearized viral genome or linearized truncated viral genome uh, with missing polyhydrin gene ORF 1629 and the gene uh, 603 is transfected into the insect cell followed by a transfection of transfer vector containing the foreign DNA along with the gene 603 and essential gene in one or two division. So, once you take this particular gene and transfect into the uh, into the uh, uh, into the insect cell lines, once they will go with the one or two cycles this particular region is going to go with the homologous recombinations and as a result the gene this particular cassette is going to be replaced with this cassette and you are going to produce the recombinant baculovirus where you are going to have the gene 603 in the front and gene 1629, uh, 1629 on the back side and in between you are going to have the gene of interest cloned within the uh, in the within the promoter of polyhydrin gene and now this recombinant vi baculovirus is uh, is ready for uh, uh, protein productions. So, a double cross event will occur a double cross event will occur between the truncated viral genome and the transfer vector with the help of flanking gene 603 and essential gene sequences as a result the viral genome receives the loss portion of gene 603 and ORS 1629 from the transfer vector and the foreign DNA is incorporated into the viral genome. So, as a result you are going to generate the recombinant 
baculovirus you know recombinant baculovirus so now whether you use the approach 1 or whether you use the approach 2 you have generated the recombinant baculovirus now these baculoviruses can be used to for protein production now the subsequent step is the screening of these baculoviruses the recombinant baculoviruses can be screened by a plaque assay the major steps in the plaque assay is that first you dilute the culture of insect cell line SF9 to a density of 10 to power 5, make serial dilution of baculovirus stock in serum containing media, add 1 ml of virus sample to each and incubate for 1 hour at 27 degrees Celsius. Now remove the viral diluted suspension and then detect the presence of plaque. There are 3 methods, 3 popular methods to detect the plaques. What are, the, what are these methods? You overlay the agarose and allow it to harden. Incubate this plate for 6 to 8 days at 27 degrees Celsius to plaque form and these can be visualized. Number 2, if the recombinant virus contain a laxy gene for example, then the plaque can be identified by simply adding the beta galactosidase substrate such as XGAL and XGAL is going to gi give you the uh, blue color. So, the plaque containing cells will appear the blue. In third method, cells can be stained with a tripan blue and plaque containing cells will take up the dye and appear blue whereas, the other cells will remain colorless. So, plaque is nothing but the holes within the cell. So, once you add the tripan blue, the tripan blue will, will directly go into these cells and it will give you the blue color. Now, once you are done with the screening, you can use the uh, these recombinant baculoviruses for protein productions. Uh, for before you go into the details of protein production, you have to do the culture media for the growth. We have discussed different culture media in a in a previous lecture uh, and which you can use to grow the insect cell lines. Uh, so, insect cell line SF9 is being derived from the ovaries of the army woman, uh, army worm uh, and it is maintained in TNH, FH insect media containing 10 percent FBS and gentamicin. Uh, for for protein production, you can use either the baculo gold or other serum free media, because if you, you if you keep the serum uh, serum in the in the in the protein production media, and if the protein is secretory in nature, you are going to have the high level of cross contamination or high level of contamination from the serum protein itself. Low protein media is suitable for the secretory protein as it facilitates the easy purifications. Now, let us see what are the different steps we have. So, the whole process of protein production is as such, you first what you do is you seed the 10 to power 6 SF9 cells in a 60 mm cell culture dish and allow the cells to adhere to the dishes. Now, add 0.1 ml high titer baculovirus stock at a MOI of 1 to 10. Now, incubate the cells for 3 days at 27 degrees Celsius so that the virus can infect the insect cells and it can propagate within the insect cell. Now, the collect the cells and media centrifuge at 1000 G for 10 minutes at 4 degree. So, the first step you do plating in a 60 mm dishes and allow the cells to adhere and then you make the uh, uh, single layer. Then you do the transfection with the help of the baculovirus at, at the MOE of 1 is to 10. Once the, uh, these, bacul these cells are being transfected, then what you do is you culture them and collect the uh, supernatant as well as the cells. Now, now you, have the, uh, you have the options if the protein is secretory in nature, which means the protein is going to be present in the cell culture. So, you transfer the culture supernatant to a new tube and determine the protein concentration with a Bradford reagent, which means if your protein is secretory in nature, you can just collect the culture supernatant and you can estimate the amount of protein present. If the protein is cytosolic in nature, 
then you can recover the insect cells, you lyse these cells by using the different lysis method and that actually is going to give you the cytosolic protein. So, if the protein is cytosolic in nature, discard the supernatant and wash the cells pellet with PBS, then the lyse the cells and analyze the protein on the SDS page. So, with this, uh, so this is these are the different steps which you have to follow to over express the protein into the baculo expression systems. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the E. coli as an expression system, we have also discussed the yeast as an expression system and lastly we have discussed about the e insect cell line as an expression system. We have discussed about the different approaches and different options what are available in all these different expression system and now in a subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the mammalian cells as an expression system. And with this I would like to conclude our lecture here and in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the mammalian cells as an expression system. Thank you.